Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Smith. I'm CEO of Gato Images and the Education Chair of the DMLA. And I'm really excited to welcome you to the fourth webinar in our 2021 Info Plus series. Today, we're focusing on NFTs. I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Capture, Image Rights, Pick Rights, CDAS, SmartFrame, and especially Google. Um, I just also want to let you know we're going to have a legal webinar in September, so stay tuned for that. We have others forming over the summer as well. And of course, our annual conference, Bigger, Better, Stronger, The Journey Forward, will be on October 25th to the 29th, so save the date for the conference. We're really excited to bring you another virtual conference, but with um, in-person options for networking as safety allows. Um, also a reminder that recordings from our earlier trends webinar are now released on our YouTube channel. That's free for anyone to see and to share. And our drones recording will be released next week. Um, also a reminder, today's uh, webinar will be recorded. It will be available to members and attendees uh, as soon as possible afterwards and then to the public uh, in one month. So really excited to have everyone here. Thank you for joining us for our Info Plus series and I'll hand it over to Joe to get us started. Great, thanks Tom, I appreciate it. I'm Joe Naylor, I'm co-founder and CEO of Image Rights International. Uh, I'm also on the board of DMLA. Uh, and, you know, and what we do at Image Rights, we're always in discussions with photographers, photographers and photo agencies. And it seems like every day I'm being asked about uh, you know, what are NFTs? Uh, should this be something we're looking at? Uh, uh, there's an article last March on the Fashion Law blog, uh, really interesting title, pretty no nonsense. It's basically NFTs, what are you buying and what exactly do you get? Uh, and indeed, when we read all these headlines about millions of dollars being spent on NFTs, uh, you just reflectively think, you know, what exactly are these people buying? Well, today we have uh, a great panel uh, that's here to help us answer some of these questions and to just have a better understanding of how it might, uh, you know, NFTs and the NFT marketplace might impact our business uh, going forward and what we should know about it. Uh, and so joining us, we have Sarah Conley Odenkirk from CDAS, um, be speaking from uh, the legal perspective, uh, Eric Wingrowski from Steg AI, who will be going to some of the technical aspects of it. Uh, and Andy Parsons from Adobe, who also uh, created the content authenticity initiative there. Uh, and he'll be discussing from the angle of Providence authenticity and, and some of the apps and services out there uh, dealing with this. So what, on today's uh, webinar, it's, it's going to be uh, really just a discussion, a back and forth questions, uh, talking about various topics. And uh, throughout the discussion, please feel free if uh, questions come to mind, just click on raise your hand. And uh, towards the back half of the hour, we'll, we'll take on some of those questions and we'll uh, call on you, go ahead and make sure your video's on and your mic and, uh, and we'll go that way. The scheduled for an hour, uh, it's not a hard stop. If uh, the discussion is still quite lively and we wanna keep going, we can, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists just to uh, say a little about themselves for a couple of minutes, just to give you a better background of what they do and what their perspective is on this. And uh, Sarah, why don't we start with you? Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I am an art attorney. My practice is exclusively fine art. And of course, now it is exclusively NFTs. Um, I've been practicing for a really long time. I can't believe it, over 25 years now. And um, this year I joined CDAS, which I'm delighted to be a part of, uh, working with a bunch of really interesting and creative attorneys. So thank you for having me here. I look forward to our conversation. Great, thanks. Uh, Eric, how about you? Sure, thanks, Joe. Hey, uh, my name is Eric Wongrowski. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Steg AI where we're building uh, tools for copyright protection authentication. Uh, my background's pretty technical, as Joe mentioned. Um, I uh, graduated with a PhD in uh, computer engineering in 2019 uh, before I uh, started my company. Uh, my expertise is really in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, but I have uh, worked with some blockchain uh, technologies going back to 2014. 
So I should be able to uh, shed uh, a little bit of general uh, computer science knowledge, um, but I'm very happy to be here uh, amongst our, uh, our expert panelists. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Andy. Thanks, Joe, and thanks everybody for attending. Um, I understand, and I'm not surprised at all, this is one of the better attended webinars, and it's great to see the interest. Um, so I'm Andy Parsons. I, as Joe said, I run the Content Authenticity Initiative at Adobe. Um, and I see some familiar names in here. Many of you know that the Authenticity Initiative is really about provenance. It's a word that has is, is really come into the vernacular around not only NFTs, but digital media in general. And we think of provenance as cryptographically provable evidence about who created something, who might be signing off on it or vouching for it, um, where it has traveled, how it came to be effectively. And when you think of NFTs uh, as a, a new venue for creatives, uh, creators of all types, the idea of provenance really becomes extremely relevant. Um, in fact, the word provenance itself comes from, uh, from the days of you know, analog art, so to speak. Um, we do three things on the initiative. Um, one thing is uh, critical to this discussion, and that's building standards around provenance and authenticity of media. The second is to build these ideas into Adobe products in the creative cloud for video, audio, still images, uh, documents, et cetera. And last is uh, collaborations that we do with folks outside Adobe to kind of prove these ideas. And among those partners that I think you'll see in the coming months will be folks that we'll talk about in this conversation who are working on NFT marketplaces, NFT creation tools, and things like that. So delighted to be here and I'm excited for the discussion. Right, thanks Andy. So uh, Eric, we'll start with you. You know, first keep in mind we have kind of the full array of knowledge uh, represented here in the audience from those who are well-versed and knee-deep and uh, others who are, you know, maybe they've seen some headlines and just are curious what it is, and this is their first introduction to it. Um, and so with that in mind, you know, what exactly is an NFT? And uh, if you could also address uh, what the concept, concept of minting and how that plays a part. Sure. Yeah. Good question. And and I'm sure there's people here that know a little bit more than I do, um, but uh, I will uh, try my best. I've been thinking of a good analogy for a couple of days. Uh, so we'll see how it plays out. Uh, so I think of an NFT kind of like uh, a deed, but instead of a deed representing ownership of your house, it might represent ownership of anything. And today, I think we're mostly thinking about it in terms of digital assets like images and, um, and paintings. Um, now, normally a deed works uh, because I, the owner, have a copy and my town has a copy. So we agree that I own my house. I don't actually own my house, I live in New York, but uh, in principle. Um, now, where NFTs differ from a traditional registry is that rather than all of the information being centralized in one body, the town in this example, it's actually decentralized. And the information is distributed amongst lots of different people using a data structure called the blockchain. Uh, now, blockchain is something you might've heard about if you're familiar with cryptocurrency, um, and some of you might even be blockchain miners. Essentially, it's uh, a way for many people to hold information uh, on their computers. And it's an algorithm for the information on these different people's computers to be congruent. So it's uh, agreed upon amongst all people without a central authority. Now, how do you get people on potentially thousands or millions of computers to hold a data structure on their hard drive and do computations on it. Well, you pay them. So uh, this is typically what's known as the process of mining. Uh, so this is the incentive for people to hold the blockchain on their computers. And by holding the blockchain on their computers, they're keeping a record of your NFT. Uh, we could talk about this a little bit more, um, but since Joe asked, the process of minting is when you actually add something to the blockchain. So if I want to create an NFT, I mint that NFT, and then that NFT gets placed on uh, 
six whatever six underlying six. blockchain six. i'm using yeah. uh so uh, i'm happy to follow up on this with any questions uh i think uh we covered the basics um well what about uh, uh Eric, what about the the entity structure itself uh you know so a photographer will say okay i'm supposed to sell my photo as an nft but an nft doesn't actually necessarily have the photo it just has a reference to that photo so maybe you can speak to that a little bit yeah yeah that, that's a really good point and actually something i'm super interested in myself so like uh what an nft actually is it's a it's a file right that is this record and this file exists on many people's computers but as you mentioned joe the, the file doesn't actually contain let's say i've got a, a picture of a the first image of a black hole let's say that's that's an nft that i'm i'm trying to um mint or say that i own uh the nft doesn't actually contain this image it just contains a link to this image it might also contain some other metadata about it like a hash or something like that but this is actually a critical issue with um with current nft technology is that you know links can die uh links can change um you know websites go under all the time uh so there is not a uh unbreakable link between the information that's actually stored in the nft and um and uh the nft itself now uh one more thing i i feel i should mention is that going back to the the deed example blockchain was designed to solve something called the double spending problem whereas it's very hard for me to go and uh, take the deed to my house and sell it to Joe and then make a whole new deed to my house and sell it to Andy because the town will say, well, wait a sec, you, you only have one house. We're not going to let you sell it twice. So the central authority stops me from doing that. So the trick is uh, by using the blockchain, I can stop somebody from selling the same nft twice however there's nothing that stops me from taking an image of the black hole minting an nft selling that and then going back and minting another nft uh for a picture of black hole that's totally different nft totally different deed and then selling that so um a lot of times when we talk about this technology uh words are thrown around about like oh it's immutable um you know, it's it's secure. And I think it's important for everybody here to just fully understand the limitations of what this technology can do and what it cannot do. That's right. And, and we'll go into more of these issues here. Uh, and the big reason we have both Sarah and uh, Andy involved with the discussion. Uh, Sarah, so we know a little bit more about what an NFT is. What should a photographer or musician, illustrator, any creator for that matter, consider when they inevitably ask themselves, should I be selling my works as NFTs? Um, and kind of along the same lines, uh, the agencies, uh, a syndication agent or a photo agency, what should they be contemplating um, when you know their contributors come to them and say, should we be selling NFTs in my photos? Uh, what's kind of your take on what you would tell them uh, when they first dive in? Sure. Um, there's actually quite a lot that people need to consider, and that has definitely evolved over the last couple of months. So at the very beginning, it was, oh, my God, this is so exciting, this new technology. There's this great opportunity to make some more money on our artwork. Um, and so people were jumping in, I think, without giving a lot of consideration to how they were jumping in. And as it turns out, it's a little bit more complicated than it seems from a lot of the articles about how much money people are making. Um, you have to set up your crypto wallet. You have to be able to navigate within that crypto space a little bit. Um, and that can be very daunting. It's definitely a hurdle and a challenge still, though I think that will smooth out over time. Um, and then the question is, who do you mint with? How do you mint your NFT? Meaning, how do you make the NFT? Who are you going to go to in order to create that um, uh, directed code that's going to send people to your, your images? And um, overnight, like mushrooms, up popped uh, you know, many, many companies that promised to take your content and do all kinds of amazing things with it. And so one thing I certainly say to artists and creators is be careful who you are um, collaborating with, be careful who you're partnering up with in this process, because a lot of these 
um, middlemen have popped up with no real experience um, in the NFT space, in the cryptocurrency space, and they're just trying to cash in on the excitement and the enthusiasm around this particular moment. So that's, that's one thing to think about. Um, another thing that I think is the crucial, maybe the really the first thing to think about is why? Why do you want your work to be created in an NFT format? Um, and we can talk a little bit more about, you know, traditional printmaking uh, in the photography world or um, other traditional art practices. And I think, you know, on the one hand, it is another way, as, as Eric was pointing out, it's another way to deliver ownership to something. But I think that it's important to understand who's purchasing uh, the NFTs on the other end. So it doesn't really do anybody any good just to take a bunch of work, create NFTs and throw them out into any marketplace. You have to have a marketing plan. You have to have some thought around, again, why are you doing this? What is it about using this NFT vehicle that either brings something new and different to your work or helps you to access a different audience? So um, those would be the two primary things that, that I would advise creators to think about. And then there are a whole host of other uh, considerations that need to be made as you get deeper into that NFT process around marketing questions and, and everything else. I mean, essentially, when one chooses to jump into this space, you're starting a new business. This is not just um, a, a, an offshoot or something that you can dabble in. It really is quite a lot of new information and new territory. That said, and I'm sure we'll get to this as we continue through this conversation, I think that a lot of what we're seeing now in terms of people wanting to understand the technology around this and um, using this to create new opportunities, a lot of that's gonna end up being back-ended and we will see companies emerging. Hopefully Adobe will have some interesting things to share with us today. Um, we'll see some companies emerging that can um, effectively connect with creators and bring those products to the, the appropriate market. Oh, great, thanks. Um, uh, Andy, I'd like to turn to you for a, a moment. Um, you know, one of the fundamental benefits that you hear about is the immutability, immutability of data on the blockchain. And that an NFT is essentially a certificate of authenticity uh, that can't be forged or, or otherwise manipulated. But in reality, the statement's only half true. Uh, yes, the metadata contained within the NFT is immutable uh, uh, and can't be changed or manipulated. However, it does nothing to establish that the metadata itself was true in the first place. Uh, for example, and uh, Eric kind of alluded to this too, you know, I can mint an NFT that points to an Andy Leibowitz photo and sell it uh, and writing my name uh, as a co copyright owner into the metadata uh, and then put it out there. You know, I, you know my understanding is uh, really it's these types of issues that uh, are the very issues that CAI was created to solve, uh, not just for NFTs, of course, but really any digital asset. So can you speak to uh, what the issues are around authenticity and provenance and what you think uh, and what you and you know, the other members of the CAI are doing to try to address it. Yeah, great question, Joe. And I'm gonna rewind a little bit to Eric's deed analogy on the house. I think it's really apt. Uh, and I'm gonna jump on that and co-opt a little bit. Sorry, Eric, but uh, it's, it's a great sort of um, analog. It's a great analog, but it also proves like where the, the sort of um, reference breaks down. So. You know, you can't, as Eric pointed out, you can't clone your house. You can't command C, command V your house and make 30 houses, but you can certainly do that with a digital asset of any kind. Take an image, for example, and I'll refer for the purpose of this part of the conversation as that as the artwork. It could be a photograph, it could be a video, it could be any digital asset. Um, it could be cryptocurrency itself. The idea is that, you know, cryptocurrency generally, uh, the, the currency itself is a fungible token, meaning you know, in the real world, every dollar is substitutable for every other dollar, but the NFT, the non-fungible token is not. So it's, if you exchange your fungible tokens for a non-fungible token, um, people assume that the non-fungible thing is in fact the artwork. And as we've all started to point out, that's not the case at all. They are fully decoupled. And in fact, they're good at different things. The artwork is good for retaining value if it's unique, but the scarcity and the thing that makes it unique is not present in the real digital world because this thing is, the artwork itself is fungible, it's digital, anybody can copy it. The token is non-fungible, but it says nothing about the quality or the data or the thing itself. So 
you're, you're right, Joe. One of the things we've looked at uh, in terms of NFTs, the CAI has a, a broader purview and, and mandate. But one of the things is how do you attach those two things in a way that is meaningful uh, and in some ways inseparable? Because just like the deed to your house, I could copy the deed to your house and run around town and say, this is my house. But the town knows that you live in that house, that it's not mine. You have social proof that you live there. You have neighbors. Wipe away all of those kinds of proofs, um, whether they're legal or otherwise. And now you live in this sort of digital wild west of the NFT world. So we started the CAI to address the, the broader problem um, around uh, deep fakes and synthetic media in general to say, um, you know, detection and understanding what something is and how it may have been modified is probably an arms race that the good guys are going to lose. If you look at, um, I don't want to move the discussion towards deep fakes, but the, the fundamental solutions to solving these problems are exactly the same. And they are, rather than prove what's fake or detect what has been uh, you know, um, incorrectly or, uh, um, you know, for negative purposes, taken over, co-opted, faked. Why don't we look at how things are actually created? And that's where provenance comes in. Can we prove things about a piece of media um, that are unique to that piece of media? And that's what the CAI does. Now, fast forward to NFTs um, outside of disinformation and other things. Uh, this is the kind of data that we want to use to fuse together the NFT, the, the non-fungible unique thing, with the artwork, which should be unique, but again, because of the way digital bits work is not unique. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, one of them effectively is to cement copyright ownership, proof that something was created in a particular tool or photographed using a particular camera by an individual vouched for by the New York Times or a media agency um, using digital signatures and cryptographic techniques that have been around for many years. Um, and effectively take this data that someone is purporting to be true um, you make some of it provable, and then you seal it in a cryptographic container, and then you attach that via reference to the NFT itself, so that the NFT references the image or the artwork, and the artwork references the NFT. And this helps us understand and, and uh, put forward this concept that the art has a certain um, viability, uniqueness to it, can't be copied because the minter, as Eric described earlier, is the artist or the creator or the person publishing that art. And the NFT refers back to that person, the work itself, uh, et cetera. Then you can take advantage of things like um, the NFT, the blockchain that the NFT lives on as kind of the arbiter of truth about financial transactions and smart contracts and the ability to pay a residual um, fee or a, a commission to the original artist on all the secondary sales of that NFT. And it allows the artwork itself to be permanently attached there so that things like copyright ownership, uh, vouching, can be handled kind of in the digital world, but when you need them to be fused together, uh, this idea of content authenticity and cryptographic metadata allow you to do that. So um, that's a broad overview of kind of what we're doing and how it ties together. But the overall idea is to make sure that that scarcity from the NFT carries over to the digital asset and that the digital asset can travel with the financial traction uh, transactions of the NFT itself. Yeah, and Sarah, when uh, minting NFTs, what do uh, the copyright owners really need to know and do uh, from a rights and licensing perspective uh, when they begin the process uh, to ensure that uh, you know they have a, everything in order and also consider the uh, uh, the case of agencies who may be doing this on behalf of their creators and contributors and then uh, I also would like you to, to touch on the, the idea that uh, and, and this is one of the most attractive things uh, to rights holders is the ability to actually ensure they get royalties on sales of the NFT in secondary markets, uh, which is not necessarily something they've had uh, the ability to do, uh, at least not easily uh, in the past. Right, okay, so to, to your first, the first part of your question, um, what do the, the creators or the minters need to be concerned with uh, in terms of rights? And it's a really good question uh, because of course, it's the same thing that they have to be concerned with in real life art as well. So um, making sure that whatever it is that's being minted is actually um, available to be minted. So if you're not actually the creator, you need to make sure you have a license to that work or some agreement in place that allows you to, uh, to, to do the minting and create that NFT. What I'm seeing with um, a lot of the minting platforms is a requirement for whoever is bringing the content to them to license the content to that minting platform so that they have the ability to create that NFT. So it's, it's about looking at that chain of title and making sure that um, the copyrights to whatever is being created 
um, are, are legitimately with the person who is listed as the creator. That brings up another issue too, of course, and that is who is listed as the creator on that smart contract that accompanies the NFT. And that can be problematic as well. If uh, an artist has brought their work to a platform and the platform uses their own wallet and puts their own name on there as the creator, then we've got some confusion as to really who, you know, who owns that work, uh, the underlying work. So number one, um, it's really important for uh, any work that's being brought to the NFT uh, format to be cleared and, and truly um, available for that minting process. That means that even if you're taking your own photograph, um, you have the proper model releases if necessary. Uh, you have, if you're adding um, animation or uh, music to that to, to make the NFT more interesting, you need to make sure that you either have work for hire agreements for anyone who's adding um, content to what you're minting um, or a licensing agreement for music. The music gets much more complicated because there are plenty of rules around uh, music licensing that people don't necessarily pay attention to. Uh, so those would be some of the things to think about in terms of bringing content to that, uh, to that NFT space. As for the royalties, and this is another kind of can of worms, um, it's very exciting that, that there's now uh, a conversation that's very open and widespread in terms of making sure that artists are compensated for secondary market transactions. This is something that, you know, within the art world, we've been trying to address for many years. Um, the Visual Artists' Rights Act doesn't quite get there, uh, so there's no federal law in place. Uh, other countries do have resale royalties in place, and, and the United States has really struggled with that. So um, there are uh, certainly a lot of conversations that happen around contracts um, and, and resale royalties that are entitled through contracts, but this conversation with the NFTs has definitely opened it back up again. On the positive side, just as an aside, I will say that and having more artists ask me to write in resale royalties clauses to their regular sales contracts than I've ever had before. So one positive would be that this conversation has really generated some movement in, in every aspect of the, of the art world um, the, on the transaction side. With regard to resale royalties um, in NFTs though, the issue is that we don't yet have interoperability between um, all the different types of NFTs that are being created. So smart contracts on one platform don't necessarily work well on another platform. So if you have resale royalties written into your smart contract, that's great. But if it's transact, if the secondary market transaction happens on a different platform, there's no way of guaranteeing that that resale royalty is going to come back to you based on the, the way in which um, that contract operates. There's also no way to guarantee it if people just simply decide that they're going to transfer their NFT asset from their wallet to someone else's wallet and take payment off chain. So there are a couple of ways in which people can get around it. So it's not a silver bullet. It's not the solution and the, and the answer, but it has raised an interesting conversation that I'm hoping will um, continue to grow and, and will give some more thought to how that can happen. One last point about the resale royalties too is that I'm having a lot of clients come to me with collaborative projects where they want to split those resale royalties in multiple places to, to, to go to multiple parties. Currently, that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, there are some people who are writing custom contracts that may be able to affect that. But for the most part, those resale royalties come back to one wallet and any further distributions have to happen um, you know, on, a, on a manual basis. So, I mean, it sounds like if you're looking to take the plunge, you really need to talk to your own uh, attorney, copyright attorney, just to make sure that you understand all the issues. Or, or, you know, you're just out there kind of blindly going to these different platforms and just kind of reading uh, descriptions of the services they provide, which, you know, can lead you down the wrong path easily. I, I, where do they start? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is what's what further complicates it, uh, and I'm sure that Andy and Eric can speak to this as well. The terms of service and terms and conditions on various platforms differ tremendously. So there's really no standard practices yet in place and standards in the industry that you can rely on without reading through those, um, those specifics on each site. So it is important to read that. That said, I mean, of course, my preference is people call their lawyers, but I understand that that's, you know, that can be a little bit burdensome. Um, but I do think that it's worthwhile at least to get a system in place 
so that you understand where you need to get releases, where you need to get permissions. Um, and then also, again, back to what I was saying earlier, figuring out who your audience is. Like you're going through a lot of effort to create something and to it, it's gonna cost you money, especially if you're minting um, on the Ethereum blockchain, you're paying a substantial amount of money to potentially mint those NFTs. And so you, you've got this big investment, it's probably worthwhile to get a little bit of advice, at least to figure out the proper business strategy to uh, approach this with. Uh, Andy, what um, apps and services are out there or under development that you're aware of that are really aimed at facilitating uh, kind of access to the world of NFTs to buyers and creators, just making it more maintain, uh, more uh, mainstream and accessible? Yeah, it's a great question, Joe. I think there are lots of um, sort of fragmented efforts all over the startup world uh, inside established companies. I think we're all in big tech, small tech, um, even human rights in areas where photojournalism is looking at NFTs as ways to guarantee uniqueness, copyright, ownership, origin. Um, we're all struggling with um, the on-ramp process for even a sophisticated user, let alone your, you know, I would say average user of Photoshop, who's really great at using Photoshop, is a tremendous artist. But the cognitive overhead of learning how this stuff works, um, I think Eric just touched on, you know, the, the very tip of the iceberg. Um, if you need somebody with Eric's expertise and technical depth and someone with Sarah's legal depth to even get started, um, it, it stands to reason that this is sort of, uh, you know, untenable for for most people still. But the efforts that are um, underway to help that, uh, I like to look at what's in what's going on in the standards community because they tend to be harbingers for like really deep technologies that will be established. For example, if you rewind the clock to a time when web browsers, um, before mobile devices, when web browsers didn't have a, a lock icon, you know, some people were perfectly happy to enter sensitive personal information into web forms without any guarantee that the channel was encrypted or that there was a trustworthy party on the other side. Um, through standards and broad adoption, uh, that day is long gone. Um, and yet still there's some esoteric aspects of understanding what the lock represents. But for day-to-day -day transactions, credit cards, you know, entering your social security number, the deed to your house, for the most part, people understand what that means and frankly, what it doesn't mean. And I think we'll see the same thing happen with NFTs uh, and NFT marketplaces and blockchain in general. If you think of SSL and encryption as kind of the machine language of financial transactions on the web, I think all the things we're talking about now and some we haven't even raised are the machine language of NFTs. So the kinds of efforts that I'm keeping an eye on are in standards, things like decentralized IDs, or some of you may have heard of self-sovereign IDs, which takes the idea of authenticating you as a user, an artist, a buyer, is removed from uh, centralized authentication authorities like Google and Facebook and Adobe and others, and put back in the hands of the user so that whatever you do and wherever you go, you have effectively a digital passport that is unique to you. And you can decide who gets to see what, you know, just because I'm minting an NFT doesn't mean you need to know where I live or have a picture of me, but maybe you need to know that I hold a copyright on that particular work. And that can be accomplished with self-sovereign ID. However, with, as with many standards, it will be years before they're widely adopted enough. And I think that's where you're seeing opportunities for startups and small companies to enter the game um, and sort of hide all of this complexity from users. But with hiding the complexity, it also requires that they do that responsibly. Um, you'll see a lot of venture capital activity in tools that uh, will provide search engines across all the various NFT marketplaces, search the Ethereum blockchain itself for things that are NFTs, and then go to the decentralized storage of the NFT artworks and show them to you and direct you to the right place. And there are you know, smart contracts that will ensure that folks trafficking and those kinds of businesses can get a cut of the financial transaction as well. But I'd be hard pressed to point my finger at a single tool um, rather than a general technique or a standard that I think is on the verge of cracking this nut. Um, you know, I can't say too much about how, what Adobe is doing here, but I would keep your eye on Adobe. Um, and if you think that, if you, if you naturally assume, correctly assume that things like Photoshop kind of at the very center of the ecosystem um, could do things to help the on-ramping process. You know, Adobe has uh, an account for you Adobe could help you get acquainted with marketplaces and sort of upload things to a marketplace without all the esoteric concerns about having a crypto wallet and those kinds of things. Um, those are certainly things we're thinking about. And I think if you keep an eye on, on what we're doing and, and other companies, you'll see a unified way to simplify this, but it is not, it's not here yet. Yeah. Uh, and on the kind of the financial aspect of it, you know, the, 
some of the marketplaces are making it much easier because they're allowing you to just make a credit card payment and they'll do the conversion to the crypto in the background. Uh, however, if you're the one selling NFTs and you're successful at it, you're generally getting a payment received in Ether or whatever that happens to be. Uh, you know, I know you're not a CFA, but you know, are, are there tools that can easily move you know, your ether into fiat currency, or if you, if you don't have the risk appetite for holding a bunch of crypto assets, or you know, have you heard of anything being done kind of in that realm? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you, I think if you look at the development of crypto assets in general, um, Coinbase is a great example of somebody who kind of democratized access to crypto, right? You don't have to, basically Coinbase will act as a proxy for your wallet and all your connections to various blockchains and act as an abstraction layer on top of the, the if you choose, if you can be a you can be a very sophisticated Coinbase user and understand as deeply as you want and control as much as you want. It's, it's sort of like the difference between buying a, a a mutual fund versus trading individual stocks. If you are like me and you'd rather have somebody else do the hard work, you can use an app like Coinbase to manage it for you to show you what your equivalent is in dollars and fiat only if you choose to do so. Do so. I think you'll find the same thing with NFTs. So you know, having um, early entrance into the wallet marketplace like. Um, I think uh, probably MetaMask is the best example. It's pretty accessible, right? In years past, MetaMask was as inaccessible as something else. For those who don't know, MetaMask is a browser plugin that runs in your browser. When there's a site that wants to access your MetaMask um, credentials and access your Ethereum uh, payment addresses or do transactions, it pops up with a window. You choose the account. You know, It's not that different from inter interacting with your bank. The difference is it's decentralized, like all of this crypto stuff. Uh, as opposed to Coinbase, which is effectively a centralized service sitting on top of these decentralized um, crypto uh, asset trading markets. So I think we'll see the same thing with NFTs, um, a single sort of clearinghouse for you to manage all these things in the style of a MetaMask wallet where you can buy and sell things to various marketplaces. One of the things Sarah pointed out, of course, is that currently uh, many of these marketplaces exist on incompatible different blockchains. So moving an NFT or an asset or a transaction between blockchains is an area of uh, exploration, research, and I think innovation um, while this sort of shakes out. Will there be one blockchain to rule them out all? I don't know. It might be Ethereum. Right now, Ethereum has the downside of being very expensive and potentially destructive to the environment, um, depending how you look at what it actually does. It's moving to a different system that is less destructive to the environment, less expensive to run. Um, but right now, there's a very fragmented area. As with most things, the last thing I'll say, like the internet itself, if you were developing a, a blockchain technology to service NFTs alone, I'm pretty sure you would develop a very different environment and a different set of technologies to do it. Blockchain as it was conceived originally, um, specifically for uh, Bitcoin, I would say never contemplated this use case. And as a result, we have to kind of figure out how to make these things interoperate. Yeah, uh, thanks, Andy. Um, I kind of wanted to turn the discussion around a little bit, uh, Sarah. You know, we basically been approaching it from, you know, what if we want to get into it, we want to mint, sell NFTs and so forth. What happens if I uh, I come across something and somebody has uh, minted one of my photos uh, and they're selling the NFTs, you know, one on one or, you know, whatever the case may be, is there anything that I can do? Like, how am I product protected and is there anything I can do about it? Yes, well, that is definitely an area that is going to be tested, I think, a lot in coming months. Um, so we'll see exactly what the fallout from um, copying and, and inappropriate use of other people's rights is. At this point, um, you know, a lot of the platforms that are marketplaces where the NFTs are listed for sale um, have in their terms and conditions that if there is something that is shown to be an infringement, it will be taken down. So in terms of having the work taken off of the marketplace, that's something um, that's fairly easy to do, similar to you know, a, a takedown notice with the DMCA for um, any other media online uh, that's problematic. The bigger problem though, is what happens to that NFT because that NFT is on the blockchain. There are ways to burn NFTs, meaning that you essentially destroy it. Now, whether it's actually destroyed or just sent someplace else, I mean, that's maybe a question for Eric to address. Um, but, uh, you know, how you affect um, getting rid of something that is infringing is uh, definitely a little bit more of a complicated question. So I think that we will have to wait and see um, both uh, in terms of what Andy's been talking about, you know, what 
tools and, and platforms emerge and evolve out of this, because those are going to be considerations absolutely that have to be taken into account as things evolve. Um, and we're also going to see some of this, I am sure, play out in the courts. Uh, yeah, I mean, we keep going back to the fact that uh, in most NFTs, the assets reside off chain. Uh, you know, Eric, is work being done in this area? Is, is the ultimate answer that, you know, the gas costs come down enough, it's, we make it less uh, damaging to the environment where we can actually start minting on chain so the asset is uh, captured with the NFT? Um, but it seems like that might be a long way off. What can be done today to kind of uh, address that potentiality of it being wiped away or a server going down or the company hosting the servers going down? Yeah, it's so, so you're asking a really interesting question and, and the pieces of the answers have, have been touched on very nicely by Andy and Sarah so far. But um, I, I think it's, it's worthwhile to just kind of take a step back and think about like the blockchain is really just a tool for storing information. So it's, it's a lot like a database, but it's much more expensive. So a database can sit on a hard drive or a couple of hard drives on the computer and, you know, it's not doing much unless you're accessing it by reading it or, or writing to it. Um, you know, the blockchain is, uh, a pro, uh, it's a data structure that requires synchronization between many different uh, computers, uh, generally all around the world. And that synchronization process is the expensive part. So when people talk about the environmental effects of uh, like Bitcoin and other kind of blockchain technologies, it's really due to this need to synchronize. And as uh, Sarah and Andy have both mentioned before, there's broadly speaking, kind of two different types of blockchain tech. One is called uh, proof of work, and the other one is called proof of stake. So proof of work is, is kind of the original that Bitcoin was based on. And just to uh, put in context, I, I just looked this up um, the other day. The, there was a nature paper by uh, Mora et al. in 2018 that claimed that um, carbon emissions from mining Bitcoin could raise Earth's temperature by as much as two degrees Celsius, just from mining Bitcoin. So that's an incredibly, when you think about the energy required to do that, that's an incredibly expensive series of operations that are happening. Now, since then, there have been new technologies like proof of stake that are significantly uh, less environmentally uh, damaging than Bitcoin. And uh, so there, Although to be honest with you, I haven't actually seen uh, any uh, studies being done by environmental scientists that have proved this to me yet, but um, uh, we'll take it in good faith for now. Uh, so um, to kind of get back to your original question about like, uh, how do you uh, ensure that the asset that you're trying to uh, protect with an NFT uh, actually is living more securely on the blockchain, I don't necessarily think the solution is just, uh, oh, we can use more environmentally friendly blockchain technologies because there's still problems with storage. And as Andy mentioned before in this really nice example, right now, NFTs point to digital assets, but digital assets don't point to NFTs. So it's a fundamentally one-way relationship. So if anything changes, uh, between the relationship between the digital asset and the NFT, that link is lost. And like I said before, I mean, most of the times digital assets are just being stored on a web server somewhere and you can access it with a, a URL, but that URL could change over time. The company that's storing it could go out of business. I think it's unlikely uh, that we'll see um, the assets themselves actually being stored on the chain. Um, but what I do think is likely is um, a way of merging the NFT with the asset. So something I'm really interested in is uh, for uh, digital photographs and uh, digital artwork, uh, how can the pixels of that artwork actually reference the NFT? So how do we marry the item to the deed, essentially? 
Yeah, Joe, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to jump in on that. And also yeah, absolutely. Try to answer Leslie's question way up in the chat, which is the essential one that um, I didn't cover in nearly enough depth. And that is, you know, how do you how do you actually make that connection between the two things? Because if we could make it immutably, uh, as I described earlier, we'd solve a lot of these problems, um, ranging from copyright to reminting to you know the right person getting paid. And I'll give you just one example of the kinds of things we're thinking about in content authenticity. So, you know, at a high level, the structure of the content authenticity data block that is in the image or referenced from the image. Uh, but to think of it as an immutable set of data that's attached to the image off a of blockchain, unrelated NFTs. Um, and as I said, it can contain copyright information. It can also contain identity information. So imagine, if you will, that you could go to a tool, whether it's Photoshop or something on the web or an NFT marketplace itself, and prove that you control a particular crypto wallet address or a particular Ethereum address for payment. There's very little incentive uh, for me to put someone else's crypto address in this uh, provenance data. So as long as I can prove ownership, just like I can use things like OAuth to prove I own an Instagram account and connect it to my Adobe account to log in, things like that, I can prove that at this moment I control that Ethereum address, which is the one where I will get paid. If I can cement that cryptographically into the image, imagine putting it into the file like XMP or EXIF or something else, and only then mint this NFT, the marketplace can check and say, is the minter's address the same as the creator's address? knowing that whoever buys this is going to pay me and maybe even not showing uh, or not allowing their catalog to reveal uh, artwork that doesn't have this connection. And that's just one aspect of the connection. But it goes one step further and says, look, when's, when a buyer is looking for those things and wants some um, indication that cryptographically these things are bound, uh, and if you trust me as the creator, then when you pay that or when you buy it on a secondary market, you, you can be reasonably sure that I'm the one who's going to get paid and that I'm the creator. If you couple that with like actual proof that this was created in a particular tool and that I am the, the person who didn't have the asset and then created it using a tool, didn't copy it or paste it in from a website, then you have the beginnings of like real provenance, artwork provenance tied to NFT provenance. Um, and that will underscore or enable the kind of vision that Eric is talking about, which is to say, probably not gonna store the large assets on the blockchain. Blockchains aren't optimized for storing large things and artwork is only getting larger as monitors become uh, higher and higher resolution. So we need to figure out ways to keep them attached um, almost to the degree, the, the, the degree that they would be regarded as the same thing. But I don't think blockchain storage of the assets is going to be the answer. And I just wanna make one comment also to follow up on that, which is that a lot of what I'm hearing from clients is also about attaching physical works to the NFT projects. And that's something where we're now in a completely different category where at this point, there's no really good way to connect the NFT assets with physical assets for secondary market transactions. So that's something that um, uh, you know, we'll see. I'm sure that there will be some more developments in that regard as well. So what, what is that, Sarah, what are the uh, auction houses doing uh, to try to verify the provenance of uh, the assets that are, they're auctioning off through their process because they're putting their, their reputation on the line in a very new space. Well, I mean, auction houses are actually a really interesting example of something new that's happening within the market space. And that is, you know, auction houses traditionally have been in the business of doing secondary market sales, um, not primary market sales. And now all of a sudden with the NFTs, they're in the business of primary market sales. So this is an interesting evolution for them, they've been for the last several years trying to figure out different ways to infiltrate the art market in, in different ways by opening gallery spaces or having art advisories. And now with NFT sales, they are truly in that primary market space. Um, auction houses are very careful. Uh, and for the most part, they're working directly with the creators. So we're not talking about having um, many issues, if any, uh, in terms of the authenticity or um, legality of what it is that they're minting. Um, they're, they're being very careful about ensuring that there are representations and warranties by the creators, if there's anything else um, or any third parties involved in the uh, creation of that work that's being minted, that they're, they're getting the proper documentation in place. So um, the, the, the thing for the auction houses, and you know, frankly, this bleeds into the museum world as well, when you start bringing a traditional art marketplace into the NFT space, there are other concerns aside from just the authenticity and provenance, but
but also like, how are they transacting business? Now they have to have crypto wallets and what, you know, how does that work? And um, what's the conservation and maintenance requirements around those digital assets? Do we treat it the same way that we treat time-based media in other realms? So it, it raises a lot of really interesting and um, potentially problematic uh, concerns. But just one more thing, uh, Eric, uh, there's a lot going on in this space, a um, lot, of, lot of challenges to tackle. And uh, I'm curious what companies you, you're seeing out there that are doing some interesting things that uh, could be a benefit to our audience. Yeah, sure. I think um, probably the first thing worth mentioning is that a, a lot of the discussion that uh, we've been having so far, we've been using NFT minters and NFT marketplaces almost interchangeably. And uh, there is a, a profound distinction. So I'm sure Sarah knows much more about this than I do, but I think many of the companies that have sprung up kind of with the NFT craze that we've seen in the past few months are all in one solutions. Hey, you uh, bring your digital asset to us, we'll mint it for you and you can sell it on our platform. And then a viewer can then view it on the platform as well. Um, but these are actually very distinct things that are happening. Um, first is actually minting the NFT. The second one is facilitating the transaction of the NFT. And then the third one is the user experience of the buyer or collector actually looking at their NFT or whatever that might be. So uh, one of the companies I've uh, spoken to recently is called Web Commodore. They're a startup that's actually kind of parallel to uh, to us. And I think they're also members of um, Adobe's Content Authenticity Initiative. Uh, what's impressed me about them uh, is um, they're not an NFT marketplace, but they are using NFT technology uh, as minters uh, for provenance information. So I can go there with an image or a file. And uh, if I want to uh, retain uh, proof that I uh, minted this file, I won't say proof that I'm the owner and have that live on the blockchain, I can use this service. Um, there's also, uh, and I'm again, I think probably the other panelists know more about this than I do. But um, I've talked to a company called Wax uh, that is specifically in, uh, it, it is an NFT marketplace uh, viewing experience in Minter that is an open platform for creators kind of in the video game space. There are closed platforms that have become really popular like Flow uh, where you need to get prior approval. And this is kind of their way of tackling the problem of, or attempting to tackle the problem of, is the person who's minting an NFT actually the owner of the NFT? Um, which is critical. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've seen lately. Uh, Nancy, I believe you wanted to say a few things. Yeah, I just thought I'd jump in uh, for a few moments because like Sarah, I think I maybe only the last week have I not gone down, uh, had a day where two or three people didn't contact me about, you know, selling their photos as an NFT or showing me some horrible agency agreement where someone's going to take 20% so they can mint NFTs of their celebrity pictures without even letting them know who's going to show up and buy it. So I think a lot of those issues have touched on, uh, but there's a couple of points what, as it applies to this industry, about the use of stock photos in creating NFTs. I know uh, I did see that the images has added uh, an extra, there would have to be an extra payment. It wouldn't be part of the general broad like uh, RF license for an NFT. Um, and coincidentally, I'm a, active in the Copyright Society. And of course, we had our annual meeting and there was a webinar on NFTs. And the moderator had an artist who I won't name, who talked about how she has jumped in the NFT market. And they're asking, well, how do you create your artwork? He says, well, and these are all of musicians, singers, celebrities. Well, I take a stock photo and I use Adobe Photoshop and I put a filter on it. And that's it. Like one has lace on it, one is something else. And everyone else is saying, well, great art. And I'm in the background thinking, holy shit, do they have a license for this? <laughs> so you're going to see lots and lots of, of derivatives. Um, I already have a client who did 
uh, artwork for uh, a popular rap artist for the album. And now they've allowed a street artist to make a painting of his photo and um, it's an NFT. And, you know, the language is so broad in the, you can use it for this album project. Is that part of promoting? I mean, it's, you know, you know, no one was thinking of NFTs until, you know, that one sold for 69 million on Beeble. Um, which if you go online, you can see many digital copies of that artwork. So um, usually all these conversations, and I've been on some clubhouse ones where the artists are all excited, like we finally have the solution to copyright infringement. We've made rarity, but you made rarity. You, you put, you know, essentially a code on one digital object. It doesn't mean other digital objects at this time aren't capable you know, of being floating around. But that's also been true with limited edition photographs. You know, photographs were never intended to be limited editions. The dealers impose that on artists like they did with printing um, because print plates used to wear out. So that's why they had to be limited editions. But dealers want to make photography rare so they have you make limited editions. But you could have the same photo in an edition in one size of 20, another size of five. I mean, there's really no rules about any of this. It just, you have to be a savvy art collector. Um, so there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of issues coming up and we have, you know, think about, do we need to update our contracts? What are we gonna do? The other question I get all the time is, do you need model releases? You know, if you're creating a work of art, you, it's an expressive work and you don't need a release. Um, so if the NFT is just an art, if the NFT now is going to be promoting something or a cause, has that changed? But that is a question I'm getting on a daily basis. Um, and, and, oh yeah, and some artists just sued a photographer, Mannion, for, for just selling photos of himself too, uh, one of the, um, so anyway, these, these are the types of things that are coming across, you know, my desk every day now regarding, you know, stock photos, NFTs. Do you need releases? You know, can you just use a stock photo and and you know all these derivatives that have been created? Uh, so, uh, thanks, Nancy. I, I did want to point out we're, we are at the hour. Um, again, <laughs> we can, <laughs> we're uh, you guys are more than welcome to say and carry over a little bit. Uh, Andy, I think you maybe had something uh, you wanted to say. Yeah, there's so much to talk about here. I just want to you know riff on one of Nancy's awesome points, which is. Um, yeah, you know, one thing to consider with NFTs, and it's sort of hard to get your head around if you're my age, um, easier for my teenage daughter, but, you know, the idea of an NFT is all about ownership. It's not about who can enjoy the art. And in this way, like th this new model for scarcity is quite interesting. So if the Mona Lisa were truly an NFT and, and something that had been created digitally, uh, anybody could enjoy it. Now, you might have, you might be able to sit, you know, in your office and look at it and not go to a museum, but there's no curatorial need for somebody to open a museum so that people can come and visit the original Mona Lisa because every copy of the Mona Lisa is exactly the same as the Mona Lisa. Um, and therefore, you know, there's this new notion in pride of ownership. What you're purchasing with that NFT is the right to own it, but the right to own it is not the right to put in your basement so no one else can see it. Um, and yeah, there are zillions of copies of that Beeple $69 million NFT. People are judging it left and right about its quality, whether it should you know, uh, bear anywhere near the value that it's achieved in the market. Uh, but the point is anyone can look at it and they're not, uh, the, the, the thing that they're looking at is not compromised in any way, but only one person can own it. And that's a, you know, when it comes to copyright things that, that Nancy and others are much more well-versed in than I am, um, it's, it's really a new world that we're entering. Um, uh, uh, you know, in working with your clients, there's still, there's so much going on here. Uh, there's still this kind of overriding question, why even enter this space? Why even build out this business? Because clearly there's more to it than just uh, taking your photos and uploading them to a certain service and then everybody's going to come pay you millions of dollars for it. Like, what, what are your clients, what are their primary objectives in, upon entering into this fray? I mean, it really depends on which clients I'm talking to. So some clients get it and understand that it needs to be used for something new and different. And in a lot of ways, you know, maybe looking at gamifying um, the experience of interaction and exchange. And so um, if artists are looking at a way to create a community and to create some sort of exchange with their audience, there's something there to be done. Or if it's conceptual artists who otherwise have a very difficult time 
um, selling something around their work. Um, this is definitely a space where they can do something really interesting um, that is more performative or uh, again, engaging and building a community around. I, I think too that it's important to understand that um, like I keep explaining to clients, like this is an agnostic tool. It's not, it's not like, um, it's not gonna change the nature of your work unless you change the way that you're interacting with it. So um, it's something that's very uh, useful for marketing purposes, for pushing information or for providing promotional material. And so, you know, there are gonna be these different ways in which the NFT tool is used eventually. It's not just gonna relate to art and so, as, as Andy and Eric have both been pointing out, I mean, we're gonna see some different um, technologies evolving um, so that hopefully it can be done a little bit better within that art space. Um, but this is something that each client is coming to it with different needs and different wants. If they come to me and they're just looking to make money, my suggestion is stick to what you're doing already for the most part, because again, this is setting up an entirely new business if you're not already making digital art. And that's something else that we haven't really touched on too much. I mean, we've been talking about digital photography, but you know, there's a difference between using this uh, mechanism for something that exists only in the digital realm to begin with versus trying to translate physical art or art that doesn't already exist in the digital realm into a digital space. So, and I, and I asked the same question of my clients who want to say, um, go from painting and drawing to AR or VR. You know, why, what's the purpose? What is it about that AR or VR space that adds something new to what you're trying to communicate or, or the way that you're working? Well, pretty interesting conversation. Definitely covered a lot of ground here. Uh, I don't see any other questions um, from the audience. So I'd just like to say one more time, thank you, Andy, Eric, and Sarah for taking the time to talk about some of these issues with us. And uh, Tom, I think I'll throw it back over to you now. Yeah, thank you again, everybody. Um, just a reminder that uh, this recording will be released as soon as possible to all of our members at DMLA. This is one of the benefits of membership in the DMLA and uh, will be released publicly shortly after uh, in about a month. Um, so everything we've said here, you can feel free to share once that's available. Please follow us on our YouTube channel uh, to stay up to date on all of those. Um, another reminder that uh, our conference, Bigger, Better, Stronger, The Journey Forward, will be on October 25th through the 29th. So if you want to see a lot more great conversation about NFTs and many more topics related to our industry um, and uh, follow up on the wonderful discussion that uh, everyone here has had, uh, please do join us for that. And finally, uh, thank you again to our sponsors for making these webinars possible, um, Capture, Image Rights, Pick Rights. CDAS, SmartFrame, and especially Google, uh, and to all of our participants and moderator today. Um, thank you everybody for coming out and we hope to see you at the conference and at future DMLA InfoPlus webinars.